what were the smartest decisions in your life? Uh, what were the things you would have done different? Speaking global, before we go into the details, you know, just like, uh, let's speak globally. Um, I'm one of these people that finds that even the, the mistakes that you make are important. So I don't think I would have done anything differently. Even though I probably made some unwise choices at certain points, that's how you really do learn, is by making mistakes. And the bigger the mistakes, the bigger the lesson. But um, I don't really had, I never really had a grand scheme of things, like a big plan. It kind of developed organically and naturally, but also with a lot of hard work. It uh, didn't just come out of nowhere. But I feel that if you, if you work hard enough and you're dedicated and disciplined, that uh, luck seems to happen. Cosmo, as a lady, you represent a tiny minori minority in the music business. Um, why do you think is uh, DJing and music such a male-dominated profession? I think it's, it's definitely changing. Um, but coming from my generation, I grew up in the 70s and the, and the early 80s, it uh, was definitely a different situation to girls growing up today. We didn't have computers around. Uh, we didn't have that kind of technology available to us. Um, for instance, as girls, you were kind of like myself. You learned to play piano. Boys played electric guitar, things you could plug in. So there was already that kind of technology thing uh, where boys didn't have the fear of it as much. Um, so partly it's conditioning. Also, I think with record collecting, I started record collecting when I was about 12. But most, well, all the girls and all the guys that I knew didn't collect like I did at that, at that time. But it is uh, record collecting, they've said, it's, it's, it's kind of like having a slight form of autism. Um, because you become obsessed with a certain thing. And it is proven that males, more than females, have slight forms of autism. So I think that's the other thing. <laughs> so I think it's that kind of train spotter attitude as well as the conditioning, the technological conditioning, which is completely different today, though. Because girls growing up today, they're just surrounded. They have to use technology all the time. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing that when, when we um, observe what women or men are doing, you can definitely come to the conclusion that it can't be a difference in skills because whatever a woman tries to achieve, she can do, of course, as good or better than the man. So if there is still, and, and it's just a, a statistical fact, you know, for example, the radio show that we run in Austria, we had in the last years about 400 DJs. Now imagine how many out of these 400 were women. Ten. Bit more. Oh, good. <laughs> we so it's getting them. better we in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's 30. But there must be some psychological or sociological reasons why it's more men uh, pushing in this direction, becoming a DJ or becoming a music producer. There's a few other things, too, actually. Um, r lack of role models. Um, when I was growing up, the only, I didn't remember any female club DJs. There was a lot of radio female DJs, and that's where I started on the radio myself. Uh, and the other thing is, is that um, if, if you want to have kids, it's very difficult to be traveling around. It's a lot easier for the guy to go away and come back and, than it is for women. That's, that's just the way it is. Not that it can't be done. It can, but it is a factor that comes into play. I kind of hesitate to um, ask you the very obvious question, but uh, were there big male obstacles uh, in your life? Well, you know, I think there's ops. I think for anyone starting to be a DJ um, or a music producer, there's always a lot of obstacles, whether they're gender based or not. I had my few, just a few good stories. I, I worked in record stores for years. And people would come in or would call and say, can you put me on the phone with somebody that knows about music? Which, obviously, if it was a guy answering the phone, that wouldn't happen. Or another time, a bouncer wouldn't let me into the club. And there I am standing there with all of my records, and he's thinking I'm trying to get in for free because he couldn't believe DJ Cosmo was a girl. Uh, or when I was doing my radio show, I was mixing live, engineering the whole show myself, announcing, answering the phones. And people would call up and say, tell the DJ he's doing a great job. 
<laughs> so, I mean, all these things, but then you kind of educate people as time goes on, and you just have to let it go. How would you explain to uh, the DJs in this room uh, what's the difference uh, of playing a radio set and a club set? It's a huge difference between playing a radio set and a, and a club set. Radio is everywhere, which is the beauty of it. It's uh, much more democratic than a club. Um, for instance, clubs, sometimes they choose who can come in. It's uh, dependent upon economic factors, if you can afford to go, all that kind of stuff. Or say, if for some reason you are unable to go to clubs for physical reasons, um, you can always turn on the radio. And that was the one thing I loved about having a radio show. For instance, some of my listeners were blind. And, of course, they would never be able to, well, it would be difficult for them to go to a club, a nightclub. It would probably be too loud for them. Um, some were parents that had children. They used to go out, you know, kind of tied down a bit more. I had a lot of uh, fans that were prisoners, which was quite interesting, uh, at Rikers Island, because the correction officers used to play my show. <laughs> and I'd have some people would call up, like, have their one phone call a week, and they'd call me up. <laughs> so I felt... I got letters. It was, it was really intense, though, because you're communicating a very positive message. Um, and, you know, they, they're able to get it through radio. I mean, actually, the best request I got was Bustin' Loose by Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers. So that was a good one from, the, from Rikers. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's... Um, the, the one thing that is a bit strange with radio is that you are sitting in a studio all isolated. And aside from the telephone, sometimes it's hard to feel your audience. Um, that's why I always like to have a telephone in the studio, and I would answer it as much as I could, just so I could see what was, you know, have some kind of relationship with the audience. Now, that's the benefit of a club, where you are really interacting with the audience. Um, and just, just how you play and how they feed off of that and what they give to you. Because I feel as a DJ, it's not just a one-way signal. It's definitely a two-way. And then I, I think it's also a big freedom that when you play in the radio, you can uh, create more mood changes than in a club. In a club, it's more functional. No? You have to make people dance. Yeah, that's true. There's, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, it depends on how free you are as a DJ, though, as well, because some DJs can take the club experience a lot further than others. But true, I mean, the, the idea of going out to a club is to go out to dance. It's, um, and whereas on the radio, of course, it's, you know, mind, for your mind and your soul and your ears and all that stuff. Because your radio audience <coughs> is probably not really dancing in the living room. Some of them <laughs> do, actually. <laughs> yeah. They tell but me they are. some of them are just washing dishes or uh, lying in the bathtub. Mm -hmm. or, uh, you, you never know, actually, what they're doing. And sometimes you don't, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, sometimes you don't want to know, but... Um, yeah, it's true. It's true. You do have a lot more freedom, I think, musically on the radio. But you don't have... The, the thing that is great about clubs is getting that kind of instantaneous response, which then fuels you to do something else. Maybe, they, maybe going a place you wouldn't have gone musically, which I, I always love that, because you never really know what's going to happen, which is, which is wonderful. You can get that on radio, too. I mean, there's that kind of um, intuition thing that goes on with your listeners. And it happened to me many times where I'd, I'd have, I'd be playing one record, turntable one, I'd have a record queued up on turntable two. And before I've even played it, somebody's called up and requested the song that I'm about to play. And this happened a few times. And then you kind of really know that you're on a certain plane with your listeners. It's just great. So there you do have that kind of interaction because you're all feeling the same way. The, you, you've been uh, in those legendary clubs in New York where uh, now generations of uh, young people are just reading about and talking about or uh, seeing documentaries about. Uh, from your point of view, as you live those, uh, those places, uh, what was the legend? Or do, do we have today clubs as good as that, or were they definitely legendary? And, uh, you know, you know what it is? It's getting all the ingredients right. And that's, I think, where we all fall down in, in certain ways. It's not just about the DJ and the DJ set. It's about, it starts with as soon as you walk up to the club, what the security people are like. Now, if they're going to put you in a bad mood right from the beginning, you're not going to have a good time. You're not going to have happy campers in there. Um, the sound, the room acoustics, and I think Mr. Rosner will get into that. 
uh, the sound is so important. And the, unfortunately, in a lot of clubs today, it's secondary or tertiary sometimes even. It's, you know, it's ridiculous. They care more about the, uh, the bar than the actual sound system. Um, another thing is the lighting. So many times I've been playing at a club and someone comes up and they put the strobe light on and they walk off. It's unbelievable to me. It's like not interacting with the music at all. Like the, some of the best clubs in New York, the, the lighting technicians worked with the DJs. And I love working with people like that. Like, here's a breakdown. Let's do a blackout. And, or they feel the music and they understand what's going on. They understand the colors, what colors work. It's such a big part of it. Um, the, the staff, how the staff treat people, how the bar staff treat people. Um, the also, and, and the main ingredient is the audience, the, the dancers, the people who are there. They've got, you know, it, it's as much about them as about anybody else. And these are the things, it's not just a DJ going and trying to play a great set. It's how all these different things interact and getting that all right. It's, it's very difficult to do. And it's, people really need to aspire to do that if, if, if we want to have more legendary clubs. What makes a label hot? How do you make your label hot? It takes a lot of, again, a lot of different ingredients, just like a club. Um, first of all, it's a lot of planning. You have to really think. If you're going to, first of all, whether you're, you're going to start your own label or go to another label. For me, I decided to start my own because I always think if you want something done the way you want to do it, you have to do it yourself. And in this day and age, it is easier for all of us to start our own labels and to have our own re recording studios and, and things like that. Um, so for me, I, I just decided, I had signed a few records to other people, and then sometimes they get back to you after you've you know, done the contracts, and right before you're about to sign, they say, oh no, we don't want to do it now. And it kind of jerked around a bit, no, nothing terrible, nothing I can get over. But again, another learning experience, and I realized that if I wanted to get it done the way I wanted to do it, and if I wanted to own my own material, I'd have to start my own record label, my own publishing company, which is what I did. Now, we can get into a lot of stuff about, uh, detailed stuff about, you know, starting your own label, which I'll save for the question time, because I'm not sure if any of you are doing that or not. But basically, just to give you an overview, um, which is kind of, true whether you're starting your own label or you're starting your own club night or whatever it is, is the first thing you need to come up with is your identity and what makes you different than other people and why people should buy your stuff as opposed to somebody else's. So our identity, we, after you know, you really have to think about these things before you even do anything. Ours was trying not to have an identity in a, in a funny kind of way, but I realized a lot of labels had these signature sounds and every record always sounded the same. We all loved them when they first started, and after a year, we got sick of it. So that's not a good recipe for longevity, obviously. And also, my business partner and I are really into all different kinds of dance music. Of course, house is represented quite a bit, but there's also broken beat, afro. Uh, we're doing some raga stuff. We have some uh, soca stuff coming up in the future. We have electro, so it's kind of, it's not like the same record every time, just new packaging. Also, packaging is important. <laughs> it's, it's one of the reasons I brought this stuff with me, not just to promote myself. Um, coming up with a logo, an identity, again, getting it across. Uh, for me, or for Nikki and I, we wanted to have like a template, um, different colors. So basically, you kind of, you know it's a bitch's brew record when you see it. Um, and uh, it's kind of like the imprint, but it doesn't really tell you what kind of music it is, which is really cool. You know, it's not trying to tell, it's not like, I, I love naked music and I loved how they had their covers, so that was really cool, but you kind of knew what you were gonna get. This, you don't, really, which is kind of what I like. So people have to be a bit open-minded right from the start. But it has a Bitches Brew imprint, imprint, so we're hoping that itself will stand for quality. So we had to think through all these things before we even put out a record, before we even released anything. So all these, uh, Identity is really, really the most important thing. Same with the club night. Like, why should people go to your night as opposed to other people's? What is it that makes it special? You can just do what everybody else is doing, or you can do something different. 
So the, then the, the, the next thing is, of course, uh, communication. Uh, what ways of communication can you uh, use as a producer or as a label manager to get your, uh, uh, to be talked about? Well, there's a lot of tools. Um, one, obviously, is having your own website. That's a must. You have to have a website. Two is you have to have a strategy um, on how you're going to market your record. Some of these tunes are, are quite different. The first one, we had like a deep house mix and a broken beat mix. Second one, we had, it was an Afro thing. So some of the listeners will cross over, but some of them are quite unique as well. Like for instance, Afro beat people will play this and probably not that. So you have to know your audience, who you're marketing to. That's number one. Um, and then you have to get in there through all the different avenues. One, of course, is a website and emails. Another one is press, sending out your press mailings. There's also a lot of uh, websites that um, specialize in music. They're almost like online magazines, so you have to go through them as well. Radio, I've always felt, is one of the most important aspects of the whole business because that just exposes things to so many people all at once. It's just such a great tool. And plus the DJs announce what the record is as opposed to in a club and sometimes the playlists are published online or archived. So it's another great means of promotion. I always do a lot of focus on radio DJs and even, even like uh, people that have online radio shows as well. And the biggest focus, which most record companies seem to forget about, is retail. And that's where the record's sold. And uh, they think they get all this great press. They don't know why they're not selling any records. Well, the retail doesn't know about it. And that's probably the, the biggest job. Because once you get the press kind of mechanism machine into place, it kind of you just do your mailings and hopefully it gets reviewed and hopefully it's a good one. But really being in touch with the distributors and the retail, that is the main ingredient, I think, for having a successful label. That is where the record is bought. For most of the people who run small record labels, the record label or the productions are sort of a tool to promote their personality as a DJ and then they make the big money with the DJing. Would you agree? Yeah, I do agree. Uh, that, that does happen. My DJing supports this label right now. It's not, it's not, it's not self-sufficient. It's not supporting itself yet. I'm hoping one day it will. But again, it took me a while just to support myself as a DJ. It took years of work and uh, being out there and doing it and perseverance and yes yeah, perseverance and talent all together and now that I was able to do that and then I had enough where I could start another company start a record company and hopefully that will be in the same position another few years and then hopefully the publishing company after a few years later after that will be self-sufficient but again it's time it's uh for most of us you won't get rich overnight for those of you that do that's wonderful um and you probably will be able to, if, if you're a, an artist and and you have a big record the you will probably be able to focus more on the creative aspects in some ways because you'll have a manager who's doing this and you'll have your pr people who are doing the press and you'll have all these people surrounding you doing all that kind of stuff your lawyer and all that but for most of us it isn't like that so you need to know how to work all of it. You need to know all the different aspects of how, how the, whole, the whole thing works because there's too many of us out there that want to do this. And as I said, so many people do, but why are there so few that really do do it? It's because of all the work that it takes and how much you need to know about the entire business and how the whole puzzle fits together. What about your uh, role as a producer? Because uh, were they all co-produced by you? No, no, there's uh, a few of them where have my involvement. Um, some don't, though. But, um, yeah, my, my role as a producer, I, I, I don't engineer my own stuff, um, partly because that's a whole other job, and I'm doing so many things already. I felt that I really would have to sit and learn that to do it well, so why not? work with a pro. <laughs> it makes it, you can't do everything, obviously. So decide, you have to prioritize and decide what you are good at. Um, so I, I work with engineers, but uh, I love producing. And that's one thing is when you do start your own label, you have less time to do stuff like that. I have, I've, last time I was in the studio was in June. And uh, plus there's a traveling and, and the DJing and all that. It's, um, it's difficult to get in the studio, but when I do, I just absolutely love it. And that's, 
kind of what I'd like to do more of as time goes on. Hopefully one of my records will make it big and I could be, you know, a producer more than a DJ, but uh, right now that's not the case. I don't know of too many women label owners, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you had any obstacles related to that, because I find sometimes working with distributors and things like that, they're not so um, forward thinking, but, and mm -hmm. also if you had any mentors as far as the label went. Uh, basically, I haven't had any obstacles of, of being a female. There are a few other, um, in Deep House, for instance, uh, female label owners like Jeannie Hopper, who has a, uh, one called Liquid Sound Lounge, and Bettina Costanza, who owns her own label Flipside, and she used to own a distribution company as well. But uh, you're right, there aren't many females that own their own labels, especially ones who also produce and DJ. Um, but no, I haven't really come up against that. I think in some ways it's still quite of a novelty, so it's kind of a good opportunity to seize at the moment. And I think also using Bitches Brew as, as our name is kind of funny as well, because we're the bitches. But, um, you know, we're in a very Boise environment. We're distributed through Goya, and all everybody else is a guy. It's, it's you know, it's just, it's cool. It's like, you know, Four Hero and Alex Atias and uh, Bugs in the Attic and um, IG Culture and then it's just like Nikki and I. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. I think the guys actually kind of like it, to be honest. And they've, they've been really supportive. And uh, yeah, I've never had any problems at all on the business side as far as, as being a woman is concerned. It's all, it's all uh, pretty good. I think it's how you hold yourself, too. Some women use their sexuality. If you see some DJs like... Uh, the dress up in bondage gear. I mean, obviously they're playing the fact that they are a woman, and so they probably do get, you know, sexually harassed. I'm not saying they're asking for it, but it's, you know, they're using that as a tool. Um, but if you don't, if you're just out there playing the game like, you know, guys do as far as, like, it's about the music, and it really doesn't have as much to do with my gender, and just kind of get on with it, you probably won't have as many problems. I think also there is uh, different ways of fighting this piracy. One is the legal way, like uh, you really track people down and uh, sue them. But the other way from uh, your side as a producer is to uh, create a product that is so unique that people want to have the product with its artwork mm -hmm. and they are just unhappy of having a lousy self-burned CD of it, you know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, if you make the whole packaging is quite important. So yeah, like that's the thing I love about vinyl. I mean, it is so much nicer, like all those old like gatefold sleeves that open up, and it just seems so tangible. Big record as opposed to like this plastic thing with a little booklet, you know. But um, yeah, packaging it does. You can make like collectors' items or things, you know. That people are buying it also not just for the recording, but for the the artwork and everything else. Yeah, you can kind of get past that a bit. Um, what's the average um, percentage that you offer your artists? What we do, which is a bit different than the States, is for Bitches Brew we do 50% of net profits. So after everything is paid, we share it 50-50 with the artist. And that's what we do. In the States, it's a lot less for the artist. Um, usually they'll do like anywhere from 8 to 16 points after everything's recouped on net profits. Points, you mean percent? Percent, points, the same thing, yeah, same thing. Um, if you increased your um, marketing costs, mm -hmm. would you then decrease the amount that you gave to the artists? No, what would happen is, is that would be taken as a cost to be recouped, so it would still be net profits, but it would be taken off the gross income. And then it'll be left, you still have left whatever is net. So, in, in, in fact, basically, the record company and the artists will be paying for that. Uh, when you're signing contracts, do you put a time limitation on the set you're supposed to play there? Like, you'll play three hours and that's it? Yeah, the, they usually do. The, um, the agents will usually put a, a time limit. But I always feel as a DJ, it's negotiable. When you get there, it's like, if you're having a good time and they want you to play longer, go for it. You know? But uh, yes, that, that is in the contracts. Well, we've seen DJs coming as guests in Greece, and they would play more, but they would ask more money. I don't think you should ask. I think once a deal is done, the deal is done. 
about your radio show, uh, on how many li uh, radio stations is it broadcasted? I used, I used to have a syndicated radio show uh, that was on 200 college stations in, in the States because college radio is really uh, powerful in the States. Nearly every university has a, a radio station. And then I had uh, another show that was on 50 commercial stations. But now I just, do the, I just do guest spots for different European radio stations and I have a monthly Japanese radio show. I wanted just to say a couple of things. The first is that it's really refreshing <laughs> to hear uh, a minority DJ <laughs> that uh, say things that really need to be said that I've never heard Thank before you. by a DJ, such as uh, this thing about keeping, uh, as a DJ, to keep the uh, listening, that the audience is part of the, uh, it's about the music, but yet it has to do with the audience as, as opposed to the ego. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's really very valuable and very important to say mm -hmm. because it, it, you, you have, you're in a position to influence other DJs, which, and they should hear that loud and clear. Uh, the other thing I wanted to comment on is uh, someone asked a question about contracts and uh, it reminded me of something very long ago. Uh, I was very reluctant to enter into a contract with a friend of mine who wanted my services. And uh, I went for advice to an to a older fellow, and he said to me, a friendship was never ruined by a contract. And I always remember that, and I think that's something that some of you might remember. It, it's true. A friendship was never ruined by a contract, and yet a contract is a very useful device because even though it's just a piece of paper, it's a record of someone having agreed to something. Mm -hmm. And a deal's a deal. And it also protects both parties. I think that's the thing. It's like it's, uh, everything is stated. It's all clear. This is what both parties have agreed to do. So as you said, it wouldn't wreck a friendship because these are, this is an agreement between two people and all the points are put on paper and there's really nothing to dispute. How do you feel about like you doing a set, you all into it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You in it and you got your headphones on and this person comes and tap. You, I'm sure every DJ knows about this. Um, you know, yeah, this is a bit cool, but can you play something more, you know, techie or whatever more? And it's just like, you got a big no request sign right but here. There's so many fun <laughs> ways to deal with that. I can't even tell you. One is to ask to sing it for you, and you go, I can't hear you. And just keep saying that until you sing. They're singing really loud and getting embarrassed. That's one nice thing. Sometimes requests can be good. Like once in a while, when you are, like for instance, at the loft with David Mancuso, his crowd is an educated crowd. We're, they're pretty much on the same page. So when there's a request, he should play it. You know, if it's a, if it's a good request, I just love getting good requests and I always play it if I have it because it's just such a joy. But as you said, there are some people who think they're the ones that should be DJing uh, who think, you know, I mean, I don't know what they do, but I don't think they'd like it if you went to their job and told them how to do it. Um, but, you know, one way of doing it is just keeping your headphones on. And that's what I just usually do if, if it really is getting there. Ignoring somebody and not feeding into what they're trying to get because it's it's basically it probably has nothing to do with music it has to do with their ego So or, and they're wanting to be center of attention and just not giving them the attention is usually the best way to diffuse Any kind of situation like that if it's a you can say politely. No, I don't have it And then the, you, the, some people just keep on you then you just ignore them That's the best way Cool. Yeah, it's just, you just have to kind of get on with it. I just want to know, like, uh, there was this question that was once asked when we were, like, uh, filling the Red Bull Music Academy forms. Uh, the question was quite something that I never expected to, you know, ever meet. And the question was saying, what are the three things that you do, being a resident DJ or being booked at this club? And then you find like the sound system just goes poof, and then the crowd is like, and the club is like packed. What are the three best okay, things you do? Okay, that's a really good point. I think uh, Alex Rosner will be getting into that later too. He's a sound expert. Number one, I think first of all, it's your duty as a DJ to learn about sound. You may not have to be the expert that he is, but to learn how it all works. And unfortunately, most DJs don't seem to really care. They are pushing up the gains, pushing up the master, putting the EQs all the way up, and distorting the signal before it even gets to the amplifier. 
you know, already, so that the signal on the front end is already distorted. And then they're wondering, you know, why it sounds horrible, why they're blowing speakers out. So what, number one, the first thing is to know your equipment and learn how to use it, whether it's a microphone or where you should hold it or a, a mixer or a turntable and how not to abuse the equipment and how to get the best performance out of it possible. And that's something as a DJ that it is your duty to do. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, most DJs don't even have a clue because I come in sometimes and I see how the mixers sag. I just can't believe it. Like the gain's all the way up. The EQs are like way past 12 o'clock. Uh, I mean, are you coming on after someone and they're just playing in the red? It's unbelievable to me. I just I can't. Then they can't hear it. They're not listening. So I, actually, first thing is to listen. <laughs> Second thing is to know your equipment. And then third, if there's a sound engineer there, is to work with them. And I think a lot of sound engineers and DJs have problems. And it's, it's pretty interesting because some of the bigger clubs I play at, there's a sound engineer present. So I'll always go up and introduce myself. And they're always quite shocked. Oh, she's being nice to me. The DJ's being nice to me. You're working together. So I'll tell them, listen, I am going to keep it at this volume here. I want to keep my signal on the front on a nice level, non-distorted, just clear, pure, and as the room fills up, obviously we're going to need more volume because the people will be absorbing it, but you control that. You know, I'll let you do that. Here, I'll just set the levels here and you can just, you know, turn the app up or whatever. Okay. So it's, uh, then you have problems where, you know, the DJ and the club management doesn't care about the sound system, and uh, that's a big problem. That happens quite a bit. So what do you do? Well, you try to do the best you can do and get on with it. Unfortunately, it just makes you sound bad. So basically for me, is I, don't, I try not to work in those places anymore. And I make a point of letting them know why. You need to explain these things to the management and to the, to the people that work there. It's like, you know, you're, you're open as a club, as a performance, as a music venue, and you don't care about the sound. But you care more about, like, the wallpaper or, you know, whatever, it's, it's ridiculous. And so I've made my point many times, and I've left places because the sound was just so bad that it makes me sound bad.